Good morning and welcome to the service. Good to see you out there this morning. We're going to begin our service by standing and singing about the wonderful grace of Jesus. for the morning, if you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man that is a householder, who went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for the denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Our God and Heavenly Father, we bow before you, acknowledging your total and absolute power in all things. And Lord, we thank you that you were willing to come and to die, and that your blood covers us so that we may approach the throne of God. 
Lord, we just pray that you will give us strength each and every day to be a witness to others and to speak your gospel to them as we are commanded. Lord, we think of this time of our church and our congregation, Lord. We pray that you will continue to increase our congregation, both in numbers and in strength. Lord, we just pray that each day we will be in your word, we will be memorizing, we will be reading, we will be meditating on it, and that we'll be constantly in prayer, Lord. We pray for the missionaries that go forth from our church and those that we support, Lord. We just pray that you'll continue to bless them in their ministry. We just pray that you'll continue to meet their financial needs, but keep them strong and focused on you. Lord, we think of our nation at this time, and we just pray for healing in our land. I pray for our, our current president, Lord, and I pray that you will give him lucidity of mind, that he will realize the condition and the state that his soul is in, and that you will allow him to call unto you in these last days of his life. Lord, I pray for this election that's coming up, and I pray that it will be run legally, fairly, Lord, that the people will have a decision to make. And Lord, we just pray that you will be with each and every one of us, Lord, as your children, that we will turn to you and that we will seek the great and ultimate revival that this nation needs if we are to become great again. Lord, I pray for Israel and I pray for safety there, Lord. As it says in your word, fewer and fewer people are there to support Israel, but you are there. And Lord, we just, just take comfort in reading your word and realizing that everything that's happening in the newspaper, you already told us about. Lord, we just pray that you'll be with everyone as they go out from here throughout the week. Continue to guide and direct and bless them, Lord. Bring us back home, or bring us back home here next week, Lord, or bring us home. In thy name we ask it. Amen. everyone. I have a long list of announcements. And I hand out a lot of bulletins in the morning, but I rarely open them up and read them. So I don't know if these are announcements that are in your bulletin or not, so pay attention just in case they're not. Um, I think most of it probably is. But Wednesday at 6.30, there's a KYB worker meeting in the multipurpose room. If you're thinking of helping out with KYB, I'm sure there's a spot for you to, to fit in, and I'd love to have you there. Uh, next Sunday is um, a family teens KYB skate uh, afternoon activity. That's in, I believe it's in Columbus Grove. Yeah, Columbus Grove uh, Skateland, which we've been there as a church group before, had a good time. Um, I think the idea is to uh, kind of get some excitement going for KYB and the kids too. I'm, I'm, it's open for everyone that wants to be a part of that. Uh, bring your skates. Last time we went, uh, Glenn Coates skated. Remember getting close? Uh, probably the first time that they had had somebody in their 90s skating on their, their floor. Um, Wednesday, September 11th at 6.30, uh, there is the first KYB and teen group. And there's also a uh, adult Bible study. Um, that's the uh, September 11th. So put that on your calendar. September 22nd, there's a congregational meeting to discuss and vote on the uh, child protection policy. Um, and there's copies of that back in the foyer if you're interested in what that says. That's on September the 22nd. Uh, this time of year, there's also the church officers being elected and there's a box uh, for nominations. Let's see, in preparation for a church officer's election in November, there's a box in the foyer for your nominations for the different positions. And then the August harvest party is coming up. So hopefully we have nice weather on that day like we're having today. Uh, that's on October 5th. And then last but not least is the, uh, um, the life groups begin at 6 p.m. on September 15th. And there is the sign-up sheets now available there in the lobby. And uh, along with that, I have one of the, the groups. And I was thinking over the week, actually just last night really reminded me of it. Uh, we take a lot of 
family videos. And my parents did that with the kids. And uh, what you find yourself doing, or what I see, is the kids going back and watching these videos from time to time. And you have all these little just short clips. You know, you don't usually have a, a long video. It's something that is only uh, seconds long. But it'll be of a, a child opening up a gift. And, or, or worse, you know, beating on their brother or their sister when they're not looking, or, or something along that line, a little bit crazy. And, uh, but, you know, their kids are so intense, and they're so, they're into whatever they're doing. You know, they're very, and they have this little voice, and they're talking funny, and, you know, it's neat to look back on and laugh and, and think about how they've grown up and how much they've changed. And I heard a quote this last week. This is a, a little bit of a harsh transition here, but from John Calvin. And he said that the Bible is God's baby talk to his, his children. And God is so big, and our minds and our, uh, we, can't even, we can't even comprehend. We're, we're very serious about everything we're involved with. We're uh, opening our gift or, or beating our brother and sister over the head, and it's on film, and, and God can look back at it and chuckle probably. But uh, the Bible is just, just his baby talk to us. It's as, as simple as he can get for us. So our, our life groups is about um, parables, parables of Christ. And I think that's kind of the idea. The, the main thrust of the parables is Christ trying to simplify, simplify things for us because our minds are so small. And uh, that's what we're going to be tackling. It'll just be a good discussion time. Nothing too intense to be scared of, but you're more than welcome to come and bring a friend. So I look forward to seeing you. Thanks. Well, I failed to mention this a little bit ago, but that was great singing this morning, and we're going to hopefully continue that as we stand and sing our praise and, praise and worship songs now.
Thank you. Please be seated. Amen. That is good singing this morning. I'd like to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 20. And I just want to thank Isaac for his willingness to lead a life group on the parables. And Isaac, if you don't mind, I'd like to borrow one of those this morning. But I did Google it and found out that there are, well, the information I got was 38 parables. So, Isaac, you got 37 more to work with, okay? But this is an important one because this was the one, if you'll notice the context that Jesus gave just before he went to Calvary. Isaac's just now coming in. I got to repeat all that. <laughs> okay. We love you, Isaac. Just, okay. Uh, Labor Day, that's what it was. I mean, I, that, that's what got me over here in this neck of the woods, Labor Day. You see, you see the word labor up there? Labor. And God saved you so that you'd labor in his vineyard. You know that, right? Okay. Some of us have been at it now a little longer than others, but the point of this parable is thank God for all those. No matter what time of day, they check in and they want to start working beside you. It's all about grace. That's what this is about. And I'm just trying to get it, un un understand it this week, and the Lord reminded me of a true story. Now, you won't believe this, but you, you check it out for yourself. Over there in South Central India, a man by the name of Ali had a huge farm. And I mean, he had the grain going, he had orchards going, he had it all, gardens, he had it all going. He had to work, but he, they said he was one of the most contented men who ever lived. And some of you who know how to work, you get it. If you're a farmer, and it's nothing like rolling up your sleeves and giving it all you got at the end of the day, you feel very satisfied because that's how God wired you, right? But one day a man stopped in his house and said, um, you know, there are diamond mines around here. And if you've ever, ever found one of those diamond mines, you'll be set for life. You won't have to work anymore. <laughs> and for the first time, that man went to bed that night discontented. And he got up the next morning, he put a for sale sign out there in front of his house. Sold his farm, and he set out to search for a diamond mine. And the story I read said he went from country to country to country trying to find a diamond mine. And never found one. And he took his own life because he suddenly he became discontented. Meanwhile, back at the farm, the guy that bought his farm took his camel down to the creek that ran through his property. And as his camel's drinking, he noticed over on the other side in the sand something shiny. And he went over there and pulled it out, one of the largest diamonds you'll ever find. And they discovered on that man's property, the one that went all around the world looking for diamonds, they discovered the largest diamond mine on his property. Now, I, what I try to do when I come to a passage of Scripture like this, here it is right here, I, I try to condense it down for my own sake. What in the world is this about? And trying to do that this week, this is what I came up with. The opposite of covetousness, and sometimes we learn best by turning the coin over and seeing what the opposite is. The opposite of covetousness is contentment. And what do we mean by contentment? A contented individual is grateful because he's learned to rest in what God's given him. Let me go one step further. Regardless of what God may have given to somebody else. Let's look at what Mike read a moment ago. Chapter 20, verse 1. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who's master of his house. This is capitalism. 
it's okay to own property. And he went out early in the morning. Now, I like that. It doesn't say what early is. I like that. But he went out. He did it. He didn't send somebody out. He's the landowner. And there's no middleman here. He's in charge of the operations. He went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. So he went down there to zip recruiter because he needed somebody in his fields to pick some grapes. That makes sense? I got to go down there to zip recruiter. And a couple guys standing in line already early in the morning. Watch what happens, verse 2. And they agreed. They negotiated for a price. When he agreed with the laborers for a penny or a denarii, that's about what a Roman soldier would make each day. They struck a deal, and he sent him out to his vineyard. And so he went out about the third hour, and the way they're keeping score here, tracking time, I'll just help you with this. I tried to do the math in my own mind. When I came to Christ, if I lived to be 80 years old, of course, I hope to live a little, a little longer than that. We'll see. We'll find out. Of course, Jesus could come here real soon, right? So that, that's good for all of us. But, okay, right about 806 is when I checked in, okay, spiritually speaking, just in case you're wondering why that's up there. Actually, that's the only clock I could find right there. But in the story here, some started at 6 o'clock in the morning. That was just a regular time when they started. And they would work for 12 hours. And the text says that some of them showed up at 9 o'clock. And the text goes on to say some of them showed up, look at verse 5, at 12 o'clock noon. Some of them showed up at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And this is the kicker right here. Some of them showed up with only one hour to go. Now, how would you feel if you had been out there all day long working? Let's see what the text says. Verse 7 says, And they said unto him, No man has hired us. He said, Go into the vineyard, whatever is right, that shall ye receive. You can, you can trust me, the landowner is saying. And so when even was come, verse 8, the Lord of the vineyard says to the steward, Call the laborers, give them their hire. Notice this, start from the first, from the last rather than work toward the first. And when they came that were hired about the 11th hour, that's 5 o'clock in the afternoon, they received every man a penny, a denarii. And you know in the back of the line, these guys have been working now for 12 hours. They're rubbing their hands saying, well, and by the way, the landowner did this deliberately. I, I think to see what their expression would be on their faces, the ones that have been working for 12 hours. So he said, let, let's, about, let, let's turn this around. Let's start with the ones that came in last at 5 o'clock. Let's pay them first. I just want to see the expression on the face of those who've been out there all day long in this heat. You've been out there this week in the heat, anybody? <laughs> Did you go to the fair, look at the chickens? There was some heat up in those barns, right? But here we go. Look at this. When they that were first came, they, so here's the problem. Unmet expectations. This is a lot of Christians' problem right here. Unmet expectations. That's what causes many Christians to go sour, by the way. And when the first came, they supposed they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny, a denarii. And when they had received it, check this out. You know what they were doing? They were comparing themselves among themselves. They started complaining. They started criticizing the master of the house. And they said, now, hold on now. These last have worked but one hour. What, what are you thinking? They have only worked an hour. And you've made them equal with us? We're the ones that bore the burden and the heat of the day. Now, now the master talks. Verse 13 says, I appreciate that information you just gave me. But he answered one of them and said, friend. By the way, when he goes into that mode. When Jesus goes into that mode and calls you friend, you better buckle your seatbelt. <laughs> uh, friend, I've got something to tell you. I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for a denarii? Look, you take what's yours. Go your way. But I'm going to give unto the last, even as unto thee. Is it lawful for me? Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is your eye evil because I'm good? 
By the way, there's two words for good. This is the agathos, which is intrinsically good. God is good, is he not? All the time, by the way, and all the time God is good. So the last shall be first, and the first shall be last, and many that are called, but few are chosen. What in the world would the Holy Spirit have us understand on this Labor Day weekend? I'm glad you asked. I did a little more research on Google. I wanted to know what is the average salary of someone who graduates from high school and goes into the military in the state of Ohio. And it's somewhere in the ballpark of $26,000 a year, somewhere in that ballpark. Then I Googled, okay, what does a police officer make and a teacher at a local school make? And they got just a little bit higher on the scale, maybe about 27000 somewhere in that ballpark. Then I Google, what does a firefighter make? Not that I'm looking to become a firefighter. You understand. I'm just, I just, just, just for my own sake, and help me understand the past scripture. In the state of Ohio, a firefighter can make about $80,000 a year. There you go. David, you and I are in the wrong business, man. We need to become firefighters. Okay. Then I Googled, okay, what does the quarterback of the Cincinnati Bengals make this year? Are you ready? You might want to buckle your seatbelt right about now. And then I Googled, uh, how many hours does the average quarterback work an entire year? Now, w- when they're out there on the field, they're what? They're four 15 minute quarters. And I suspect, I went generous, he's probably on the other side of the ball about what? 30 minutes a game, maybe? Give or take a few minutes? And I did all the math. I think they, I think they play 17 games a year, something like that. You won't believe this. <laughs> They work a lot less than you do, at least actual out on the field time. And they make 55, I should say he makes $55 million this year. Now, Dave, what does that do for you? Does that make you want to go to work tomorrow morning? You ought to become an NFL quarterback, man. That's what you ought to do, okay? The point I'm trying to make is I know what you're thinking. It doesn't, it's not fair, right? Is that what you're thinking? It's not fair. And if you start talking about the teachers getting a pay raise, I'll raise my hand right away, right? Right there. But it's not fair. That's what these laborers came to the master of the house and said, it's not fair. And Jesus has something for them. He may have something for you this morning. God in this parable represents the landowner. And he will give grace to anyone in this room this morning who comes to him early in life. And by the way, while I'm talking, somewhere over in Pennsylvania, I have a four-year-old granddaughter who's going to get baptized this morning. I wish I could be there. She called and asked, Granddad, can you come? I'll be right there. (laughs) Wish I could. But I started thinking to myself, I don't even know what I was doing at four years old. But I know she's got a loving environment where mom and dad are investing in her. And maybe she's there. Praise I, we, we're praying that God will really use her life to glorify us. I would say someone like that is coming to the kingdom early in the morning, right? <laughs> Others of us, like myself, we got there a little bit past 8 o'clock. And others keep coming at 9 and noon and 3. And some even show up when one foot's on the banana peel <laughs> and the other foot's in the grave. But guess what happens when we all get to heaven? What a day of rejoicing is going to be, right? When we all see Jesus, what are we going to do? We're going to sing and do what? Shout the victory. That's what this parable is about. I thank God for people who come at the very last hour. Praise God for them. Now let's break this down and see what he's trying to tell us this morning. God the landowner is giving you grace. And he'll give it to anybody. Maybe you're in this room this morning. If you hear his call and you cry out to him, he'll give you grace no matter when you answer the call. Now, I probably should stop. I can't spend a lot of time on this. But look at the last chapter. I'm going to show you how all this came about. Chapter nine, 19, rather, verse 16. I'll just, i got to just tell it to you quickly. A rich young ruler came to Jesus with a question. Here's the question. He said, here's that word again, agathos, intrinsically good or honorable master. What 
agathos, what intrinsically good thing can I do that I can have eternal life? I want to go to heaven when I die. By the way, you know what that tells me? You can be rich, and you can be young, and you can be president of the company. I mean, beyond your, your little cubicle, you, you got the top office <laughs> with your name on the president and be missing something. You can be in this room this morning, have all those things. It's just That's what this man was. He had it all going on as the world counts success. But he knew deep, 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 deep down on the inside, deep, I'm missing something. So he came to Jesus and he said, you know, I, I've tried everything the world told me would make me happy. And it, there's something missing. Could you help me with it? And so Jesus helped him with it. He said, now, you know the law. I know the law. We're not going to concentrate on the first tablet. We're going to concentrate on the second tablet. You know, the ones that talk about relationships with mankind. Have you ever killed? No, I've never killed anybody. Ever committed adultery? No, I've never committed adultery. Ever stolen anything? And he went through all of that. And look what he said in verse 20. The young man said to him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. It's like, wow. Jesus said, I, I've been waiting for eternity to meet somebody like you. you you've never sinned. we got a second Jesus on our hands. And then Jesus put his pulse on the problem. He said, uh, there's something you've overlooked. Tell you what you do. You go sell everything. Give it to the poor. And you come follow me. Look what happened in verse 22. He went away sorrowful because he wasn't willing to do it. He was filled with covetousness. Now, Peter is watching that go down. Peter is. So Peter comes right in on top of that, and he says, Now, Lord, look. Look at verse 27. We have forsaken everything. We didn't do what the rich young ruler He walked off the pages of the Scripture. That's all we know about him. But, Lord, we're the ones who forsook everything, and we're following you. Here's his question. What are we going to get? And Jesus said to Peter, everyone that's forsaken houses, verse 29, brothers, sisters, father, mother, wife, children, lands for my sake, and shall receive a hundredfold and shall eter and inherit eternal life. Peter, you never sign up to follow me, but what you don't get a whole lot more than what you give. You sign up to be a part of my campaign, you're signing up to be a part of my kingdom. Then Jesus came down on top of that in chapter 20, verse 1. He said, by the way, in case you're listening this morning, let me just go ahead and tell you what the kingdom of God is like, what the kingdom of heaven is like. And it's like a man who came early into the vineyard, worked all day long, and he gets the same thing at the end of the day, salvation, that the man got who came at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. What does this text have to teach us about how to live resentment free and I've been around Christianity long enough to know that there are a lot of Christians who are just resentful I mean you know what why why can't I be in the big city why can't I have the big church again I just say to that I thank God he led me to Arlington Ohio I lived in the big cities. I know what goes on in the big cities. And my two daughters used to live in big cities. And every time I go to Atlanta to visit the one now, guess what I want to do? I want to get back to Arlington, Ohio with one stoplight. Which if you time it right, you don't even have to stop at that one. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I love that kind of lifestyle. And somebody said, the grass is not necessarily greener on the other side. The grass is greener where you water. Have you heard that one? I'm, getting, I'm, I'm chasing way too many rabbits this morning. I've got to stay on the trail here. Number one, if I were you and I wanted to live a resentment-free Christian lifestyle, you know, Isaac stood right about here a while ago and, and just rattled off several things that our church is about to do, KYB, life groups. Uh, if I were you, I would seize Every opportunity that I had to serve my Savior 
as early as possible as you possibly can. I mean, you're looking at somebody who came in the vineyard about 8.05, 8.06 in the morning. If God lets me live till 80. And, and, and when Pastor Jim Moore, our youth pastor, stood up on a Sunday morning or a Sunday evening, whenever it was. And he said, now we're going to take a van full of young people down to Magnolia Springs apartment. And we want you to be there. We're going to knock on doors and tell people about Jesus. I was all new to this. But come Saturday morning, I jumped on a van. We went down to Magnolia. And I tell you what, I, my, my heart was racing when I, and that door opened up. And you met people you went to school with. And you're standing there tongue-tied -tri trying to tell people about Jesus Christ. And then we'd have questions on Sunday nights. We'd go back up upstairs to our youth group. And we'd say, now, Jim, hold on. They asked me a question. I wasn't quite sure how to answer it. I'm glad you asked that question. Let's deal with it. When God saved me, I praise God he saved me at 17 years old. I wish he would have saved me early. I had plenty of opportunity. didn't quite understand it. But the Holy Ghost drew me to himself when I was 17. And I began to become a part of everything the church had to offer. They got to read through the Bible program. Guess what I did on my way out the door? I pick up one of those little booklets, and I read a little bit in that booklet, and I read my Bible. I did that for years. That's how I cut my teeth, understanding the Word of God. So seize opportunities. <laughs> you may have to get out of bed in the morning, but seize opportunities to serve Jesus Christ as early as possible. And the way I'm looking at this is, it's my highest honor. It's my greatest privilege to serve the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. I went over to the nursing home this week. And Joe, I had to wake up your dad, Jack. You know that. He likes to sleep these days. And I, what I like to do is I like to take Jack's Bible. He got one of these large print Bibles. And I like to read to him. I read and read and he went back to sleep on me. But that's okay. I, I was getting a lot out of it myself. And I was reading over there in Psalm chapter 40. Where it says, I waited patiently on the Lord. And he heard my cry. And inclined his ear unto me. And I just sort of meditating on the words. I'm reading it. I thought about that word. And you know what a recliner is. It goes in that direction. But an incline goes in that direction. I, I waited patiently on the Lord. I waited patiently. He heard my cry. And he inclined, he, he inclined his ear unto me and heard my cry. He, he brought me up also out of an horrible pit. Even out of the miry clay. I thought, clay? I've heard that word clay. Well, of course. I grew up in Clay County, Florida. And the text says, out of the miry clay. That old sticky clay. And set my feet upon a rock. And established my goings. That's what he did for me. And I'm starting to get happy and all excited in a nursing home. When I'm reading about what my Savior has done for me. And ladies and gentlemen, if you really know Christ as personal Lord and Savior, there's no one else I'd rather serve than Jesus Christ, my Lord. I mean, I'd take that over the $55 million without Christ in a heartbeat. You know what I'm saying? Now, this is the way Paul said it. He said over there in Colossians 3.1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Because you are dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. But when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. And then he says, let's put this in the shoe leather. At the end of the chapter, he says, whatever, you, are you glad you've been raised with Christ? I am. Are you glad when I was 17 years old, God reached in that pit and drew me out of that pit of destruction and set my feet on a rock? I am. He said, well, here's what you do about it. Whatever you do, let your neighbors see it. Let your coworkers see it. Let your schoolmates see it. You do it with all your heart to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that of the Lord, you're going to receive the reward of the inheritance because you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm thinking to myself, how in the world can I come up to the end of the day 
and watch the last be paid just as much as I'm getting paid and me get all bent out of shape, criticizing. How does that work? When I began to think about all that my Savior's done for me. Do you know over there in Ephesians chapter 2, you know what he told you over there? He says, I'll give you a new identity. Now think about that. It says, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and in sins. He made you alive. And he gave you a new, you're a child of God now. Isn't that something? How can I complain? And then it doesn't stop. He says, I'll give you a new location. I've, I've raised you from the dead, and I've seated you in heavenly places with Christ. That's locality. And then he says, I give you new responsibility. You are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So think about that. What all God's done for you. Past, he's raised you from the dead. New identity. Present, you're sitting with Christ. But you're always raised from the dead and seated with Christ to do something here on planet Earth. So, number one, seize opportunities to serve as early as possible. A genuine believer should want to do as much as possible for the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? Maybe you don't believe it. You're staring at me like you, 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 you're kind of wondering about that. Maybe if somebody said amen, it would help me out. All right, three of us believe it, then okay. Psalm 100 says, the Lord is good. And it says, his mercy is everlasting, his truth endures to all generations. Are you glad for that? So here's what I should do. To bear the burden of the heat of the day for Jesus Christ is my highest privilege. And my attitude ought not be at the end of the day when everybody's getting paid. Wait a minute, he just came in at 5 o'clock. I've been out there working all day long. I should get more than him. I should get more than her. My attitude ought to be one of gratitude, okay? Are you content with where God's placed you? Are you content with what God's put in your hand to serve him with? Number two, I've been thinking about this, and I think number two, it would help us if we would strive to stay in our own lane. You've heard this little expression running around now. Stay in your own lane. Stay in your own lane, bro, right? <laughs> Stay in your own lane. Don't get out of your lane. That's what these guys did at the end of the day, the ones who had worked all day, and they supposed they should get more than the others. God is not bound by your understanding of what's called the fairness doctrine. Do you realize fairness is based on the will of the majority, and that's subject to change with the wind. You know that in our society, things change all the time. But justice is based on what thus saith the Lord in his word. And that is eternal and it's universal. So don't come along at the end of the day and say, that's not fair. You're not the landowner. Matter of fact, if you look carefully at this, this text of Scripture, the ones that went out early in the morning, they negotiated a price. The others that came along at 9, 12, 3, and 5, they just said to the master, whatever you think is fair, whatever you think is right, is what they said. We'll take that. Look at verse 4, for example. And they said unto them, Go ye into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I'll give you. And so they went their way. Don't come to God with your opinion, with your fairness doctrine. You want fairness, by the way? This is fairness right here. Do you agree? All of us in this room deserve death. It's just physics, folks. If there's an up, there's a down. If there's an exit, there's an entrance. And if there's a heaven, guess what? There's a hell. And all of us were born in sin. And the best thing we can do is find Jesus Christ as soon as possible and receive the gift of eternal life. That is called grace. That's called mercy. We all deserve death. But God went to the marketplace throughout the day and he kept calling people into his vineyards. Strive to stay in your own lane. The church in 2 Corinthians struggled with this issue of fairness. And Paul, in the context, was dealing with some false teachers. And Paul said, if you're wise, we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. 
But they measuring themselves by themselves and those that compare themselves among themselves, they are not wise. And that particular word wise is the idea they lack understanding. It's not in your best interest to look at what God has done for other people and forget what he's done for you. That will just only make you complain, covet, criticize what these guys did when it came time to pay. One of the examples that I thought of was Peter. He struggled with this. So if he struggled with it, chances are you're struggling with it. He struggled with it up to the last chapter of John's gospel until the book of Acts. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. By the way, that's the answer to your dilemma right there. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. See things from God's perspective. But in John 21, you know, Jesus said, do you love me, Peter? Oh, Lord, you know I love you. No, no, Peter, do you really love me? Lord, you know I love you. No, Peter, do you really love me? And then Jesus said, look, Peter, let me tell you something. Put things in perspective for you. When you were young, you dressed yourself, and you went where you wanted to go. But I'm going to tell you something, Peter. When you get old, they'll dress you, and they'll lead you where you don't want to go. He's talking about his martyrdom, his death. You know what Peter had to say to that? He looked over across the way and saw his friend John. And he said, Lord, what about him? (laughs) And you remember what Jesus said to that question. He said, Peter. If I want John to live until I come, Peter, what is that to you? I'm dealing with you, Peter. I'm not dealing with John right now. And I want you to follow me and keep your eyes on me and not other people. Does that make sense? So if I were you, I would try to sign up to follow Jesus Christ as soon as possible. And I would strive to stay in my own lane. I Googled again. Who's the tallest man in the world? Who's the shortest man? And one day they got together beneath Big Ben there in the background in London, England. See, here's the issue. God didn't make all of us the same. God didn't call everybody to come to Arlington, Ohio. And you got to let God be God. If he wants to make somebody real tall, if he wants to make somebody real short, let God be God. But we, we, want, to, we want this fairness doctrine in our culture right now. But did you realize that absolute fairness means we all get the same thing at the same time? Do you really want that? <laughs> you know, what you have to do at this point is realize God is bigger than you are. And you're going to have to trust God with some things. I, I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Years and years and years, I cried myself to sleep at night. And I said, God, why would you let me grow up in a home like this? My dad is paralyzed, all kinds of stuff. We are dirt poor. God, why? And only now in ministry can I look back over my shoulder and say, God, I wouldn't take anything for it. I, I see it now. I get it. I get the, I connect. It took me years to connect the dots. But if God had not let me have that upbringing, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't have been able to work my way through school and do some of the things God's enabled me to do. But it's all because of his grace. So the next time you want fairness, just remember this. What you're asking for is we all get the same thing at the same time. What God wants you to do is trust him who's completely just. So number one, seize opportunities to serve the Lord. Stop looking at other people what God's doing in their life, and be grateful for what he's doing and done in your life. That's the point. And to do that, you're going to have to saturate yourself in the grace of God. Anybody thankful for God's grace? Anybody? According to Philippians 2, verse 13, it's God who pours within me the desire and the power to do what he wants me to do. I want to do what he wants me to do. That's grace. Saturate, Saturate yourself in the grace of God. Jealousy is a sign that you have little understanding of God's true grace. And if you'll do what Jesus asked Peter to do, follow thou me, you'll discover that under God's economy of grace, you get far more than if you set out to do it your way, tit for tat, and put yourself under the law. 
Verses 13 and 14, God reminds us how gracious he is. He told this man who was criticizing, who represented the others that came at 6 o'clock in the morning, he said, take what is yours, you go your way, but I will give to this last even unto thee, as even unto thee. That's grace. You come in at 530. 559, and you slide into heaven. By the way, the thief on the cross is all I could think about this week. I mean, he was dying. <laughs> he looked over at Jesus and saw compassion, mercy, grace, and love. And he, he's got something that the rest of us don't have. And said, he said, Lord, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus said, today you'll be in the I mean, on the cross, last minute. He came to Jesus and experienced grace. God's not only gracious. Peter said, he's the God of all grace. The God of all grace. Now, remember, Peter's come a long way now when he wrote this epistle. He's also a God who's good, intrinsically good. He told this man, is your eye evil because I am good? So I want to wrap it up. And if you looked at verse 1 again, the kingdom of God is light. You see that all over the way, all over the place. Because some people think God's kingdom is like Disney World. It has a beginning and an ending. And if you go there enough, you get it all figured out. <laughs> I'd like to report to you that God's kingdom is so magnificent. He has to drop on us all these parables to try to understand the mystery of it. It's big. It's eternal. And the king of glory is going to flood it when we get there one day, see him face to face. But Jesus said the kingdom of God is right here among you. I believe if you trust him as Lord and Savior, he becomes of your king, the king of your heart right now, and you desire to do his will. I think what he wants us to understand out of this parable is that God's kingdom is filled with grace. And what I mean by that is that there is not a thing in the world you can do to make God love you more. There's not a thing in the world you can do to make God love you less. Aren't you glad for God's grace? It is a gift. And the only thing you can do with a gift. When I was 17 and realized I was a sinner, <laughs> the pastor told me if I would repent of my sin and give myself to Jesus Christ, I'd receive his grace. And I took it. I look back on that day and wish, you know what, there's a lot of wasted time up to that point. But the pastor that led me to the, to the Lord was a professional businessman who taught me how to shake hands properly, how to look people in the eye when you talk to them. And he taught me all kinds of things. And I didn't know it, but God was preparing me for another level and another level and another level. I read a biography this week, a guy by the name of Isaac Watts who's written literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hymns which are in our hymnal in front of you. But he had the most unusual upbringing. He had skin problems, let me put it that way, on his face. To the extent some people thought he was disfigured. And fell in love with a young lady one time. And she came to him one day and said, no, I, I, I can't continue with this. I, I, I like the jewelry in the box, she said. I can't get over the box. She said, I don't want to date you anymore. His heart was broken. He, he went to church and he stood beside his dad one day and he wasn't singing. And his dad said, how come you're not singing the songs? He said, well, I don't like their songs. His dad said, well, then why don't you write something better? He did. For two years, he would write a hymn every week, and they would sing them in that church. Isn't that something? And one of the hymns that he wrote that I've loved over the years, by the way, one of the is my favorite hymn. I sing the mighty power of God written by this man right here. But one of them in our hymnal is on page 130. You don't turn now. I'm going to give it to you. And it talks about when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. 
Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, and his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Now, think about the workers in the field who worked all day long. I wish they could have been thinking about this. Were the whole realm of nature mine? That would be a present far too small. Love that's so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, everything. How can I complain because somebody comes into the kingdom last second when God has been so good to me? Let's bow our heads, shall we? Has he been good to you, by the way? Has he now really? My Bible tells me in the book of Romans that it is the goodness of God that leads a person to repentance. And I wonder this morning... Do you really know him? Has he gone down there to the marketplace looking for you and you've been standing around idle all day long? Would he walk up to you and tap you on the shoulder and say, excuse me, do you want purpose, meaning, fulfillment, satisfaction in life? Come follow me. I want you to know now the fine, fine print right here. He's going to put you to work. Are you in his field? See, that that's... Really, if you know whether or not you're saved, I, I don't want to hear what, you, what you're saying. I want to see your lifestyle. Is there fruit in your life? Are you truly serving the Lord? And so, child of God, what about you as we come to the communion table this morning? Are you taking advantage of the opportunities to serve? Are you staying in your lane or are you looking over the fence at what other people are involved in? Maybe you need to saturate yourself this morning with the grace of God. Father, thank you for this opportunity now to respond to you from the truth of your word. I pray that you would change us as a result of this invitation. May help us to make good decisions in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing about the amazing grace of God. Shall we stand together as we do? Amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace. That taught my heart to fear, and grace my fear relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone. Set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, His unending love, amazing grace. The Lord. Promise good to me, his word, my hope secure. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. My chains are gone. God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace.
you may be seated. We're going to observe the communion table this morning. I know, I know you want to sing that last verse. I know. But Pastor went over time this morning. Okay, that was the problem. Got too excited. But I've been thinking all week about Ephesians chapter 2. And when I came into the vineyard to serve the Lord, there was work to be done. But he wants me to know that I have a new identity. Ephesians 2, 1, and you has he made alive or quickened who were dead in trespasses and in sin. And he made you his child. That's, you used to be dead. He raised you up. And then it says over here that God who is rich in mercy for his great love where he loved you, even when you were dead in sin, made you alive together with Christ by grace you're saved. And he raised you up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. Isn't that something? You were dead. He made you alive, raised you up. Now you sit with Christ. He's not finished. All y'all know this one. For by grace you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Because we're his workmanship. We've been created in Christ Jesus unto good works. He expects us to go out into the field and be happy as we serve. Are you happy in the Lord this morning because of his grace? Father, I, I want to thank you for your grace. I, I do. I, on behalf of your people here at Baba Fellowship Church, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. I thank you for that one you just brought to Christ recently. But he's going to stand before you, clothed in your righteousness, because he's in the kingdom, and we thank you for that. Now, Father, I pray you'd help us to take advantage of these opportunities we have at Bible Fellowship Church. I want to just say thank you for the boatload of people that come out to help us with our um, Know Your Bible Club. That's just been a real blessing over the years to see how you've blessed that ministry. And the, the Sunday school teachers we have and so many dedicated, faithful people behind the scenes. We can't begin to start naming them all, but Lord, I just want to say thank you. But help us to see this now from your perspective. That we're saved by grace to serve you out of love for all that you've done for us. So please help us examine our hearts just now and come with clean hands and clean hearts to your table. Thanking you for all that you've done in Jesus' name. Amen.